Hello everyone, good evening to all of you. Thank you so much for tuning in again to one of these note videos on my microbiology class. And this is going to be a review over the slides that we were shown earlier in the week over the microscopic eukaryotes. So this is going to be again the diversity of microorganisms that are going to be studied in class that my um, professor is going to go over. And so let's start talking about the fungi, algae, protist slime molds, as well as the helminths or the parasitic worms. All right, so before we begin, we could talk about an example of these eukaryotes that are microscopic and their huge impact that they have in our health as well as our economics and nature in general. So the Irish potato famine is actually one of these instances where a microorganism that was a eukaryote was affecting so many factors within people's lives. So the potato was a crop from South America and it was brought to the old world and became a food source. Especially in Ireland. So in Ireland, you had the potato blight happen onto all the crops, and this is caused by Phytophthora infestans. And this is actually going to be a species of Umicides, um, with some brown algae. There would be some white mycelium, as well as some dark patches on the potato plant. On the tubers themselves, they would be dark and gray. And this would let to rot. So again, bad crops. They weren't able to consume the potatoes even though that was such a large part of the diet in Europe and the diet in Ireland. Um, the population in Ireland basically dropped um, by 2 million from 8.5 million in 1844, and then in 1851 it went to 6.6. .6. A million of those people died. One million emigrated elsewhere. And then by 1911, 4 million people moved out due to immigration. And again, that's just one of the aspects of how uh, powerful the um, effect of microbes are in daily life and in history with the Irish potato famine being caused by phytothera infestans. All right, let's go into the content that is going to be tested on. So we need to, again, review on what characteristics mark all eukaryotes. So again, they have a nucleus. They will have membrane-bound organelles. They'll also have a cytoskeleton. There could be asexual or sexual reproduction. These could be in the forms of mitosis or meiosis. Usually there's a diploid that becomes a haploid stage. And then, of course, the cycle continues, so vice versa as well. Um, the haploid gametes will fuse to make a diploid, and then that diploid usually will give rise to haploids. There's also, you know, um, asexual reproduction, so maybe... Um, they'll just my t they'll just divide mitotically, and then you have reproduction that way as well. Okay, so let's go and talk about the um, stages. So you could have again haploid cells, and then you'll get into mitosis to get to the haploid organism, and then they'll again mitosis. So M I T. And then you'll have the haploid gametes, so hap gam, and then those will fuse together, and then that's when you get to your diploid organism. That's basically a rundown of what happens. 
then of course from the diploid organism you'll have meiosis and then we'll go back to our haploid cells. Alrighty, so let's talk about the um, first group, the fungi, or we're going to do a, a little bit of a dive into mycology, which is the study of fungi. And then up here, I just wanted to say recombination, because that happens when gametes fuse. You have recombination. All right, back to the basics of mycology or the study of fungi. So their structure, their cell wall contains a few different compounds. We have first off chitin. And their membranes contain something called ergosterol. Like how our membranes have cholesterol, fungi have ergosterol in theirs. We have three forms of fungi. We could have single cells. Those would be yeast. We could also have filamentous fungi. An example would be mold. And then, of course, we have the reproductive or fruiting bodies. Those are mushrooms. Let's keep talking about the nutrition now. So nutrition, they're going to be heterotrophs. They're going to excrete enzymes into their surroundings to break down all the materials. To break it down, there we go. And some examples, so you'll have cellulose be degraded by these decomposers, so cellulose, as well as lignin, which is wood, that will be broken down. And it would be forming glucose. And then you would also release CO2 at the same time, as well as nitrogen. Fungi are also saprophytes. This term here, let me highlight some of these things. All right, saprophytes. Uh, this means that they obtain nutrients from the dead or the decaying materials around them. And they could also be parasitic. Or they could also have symbiotic relationships. All right. So now let's go and talk about some of the groups of fungi that we might be studying for the test. So the first one, sorry about my, um, my pronunciation, would be this one. Chytridiomycetes. This is the first group. These are going to be um, in the water as well as the mammalian gut. Those are going to be its habitats. There are some parasitic ones. And these ones will affect frogs. And these are actually multile fungi. So this is unique to the chytridiomycetes. And the multiple forms are going to be reproductive. All right, the second group will be the zygomycetes. And the interesting part of these would be that they include the black mold rhizopus. That's the black mold. And the reproductive structures are known as sporangia.
a bit of a vocab term there. Okay, the next group will be the Ascomycetes. These are sac fungi. 75% of all species are here in the sac fungi category. We include penicillin fungi, as well as the um, baker seas, sac caromyces. We also have morals, truffles, and lichens in this group. All right, next we have our club fungi, or our basidiomycetes. These are going to be what you think of mushrooms, because again, club fungi. And these also include smuts, rusts, and then we've mentioned mushrooms, so... There we are. Let's talk about the structure of fungi now. Fungi are usually made out of, or actually all of them, sorry about that. All of them are made out of hyphae. And the hyphae will form a mass called the mycelium. This is the um, kind of like the strands of the fungi, and then they come together in like a big visible mass called a mycelium. The tips of the hyphae will grow towards nutrients. And when they grow towards the nutrients, they'll actually go inside and throughout. So you could think of a piece of nutrient here, maybe some banana that's been left out on the side of the road, like a banana peel. And then you'll have the um, hyphae and the mycelium kind of just like make a network inside here and they're mining. They're mining all those nutrients and all those molecules that they could use. They're using their enzymes, they're secreting the enzymes to break down all of that material. There's also openings in the hyphae. And these openings allow um, movement along the hypha. So you could have the spore and then the hyphae. This, so the spore has this like thread-like thing coming off of it. And then you have the mycelium. Again, the visible mass of all those hyphae. Alrighty. Fungi in general are moist lovers, moisture lovers, or moist, just put moist like that. All right, and dimorphic fungi, this is another vocab. Dimorphic fungi will actually have two um, forms. They could grow as a single yeast cell, yeast-like cell, and then um, mycelium. They could also become mycelium. One of the species that could do this is histoplasma capsulatum. And this species of fungi will be a mold in soil. But then, when the spores are airborne, it will develop into a yeast when it's inhaled in the lungs. So it becomes single-celled. It goes from filamentous to single-celled in the lungs. And then this would lead to a, a pneumonia-like symptom. We also have symbiotic fungi. And this will be in the form of a lichen. The lichen is a mixture of the fungi plus either a cyanobacteria 
or algae. So you have a photosynthesis um, organism that's making the sugars. The fungi will, of course, be protection and then also breakdown. Um, the fungus will protect, absorb, and also take in the nutrients. While the cyanobacteria will just provide the sugars. Um, this will allow for the growth in new and kind of um, unheard of environments. So you wouldn't expect algae or cyanobacteria to be in the middle of a tree, you know, or on the tree's roots or something like that. That's how they're able to get there by forming these lichens. So new unexpected areas are able to be grown in. Mycorrhizas are the symbiotic fungi for plants, specifically their roots. And we're going to put a smiley face because they're working in tandem. So hyphae has a high surface area, and this allows for an increase nutrient absorption the plant then would give the fungi organic compounds and this actually happens in 80 percent of the vascular plants so a ton of them have these little uh, fungi helping them out as well Let's highlight some key terms. There we go. All right. Next, let's talk about the reproduction of fungi. So we have to talk about the spore. These will be carried by wind or H2O. And spores could be sexual or asexual. And then these will, of course, as illustrated up here, they'll become hyphae. And when it's sexual reproduction in fungi, this will be the fusing of hyphae. Specifically, positive will fuse with negative breeding type. This is going to form something called a dye carrion or something that has two nucleus two nuclei i should say when the nuclei fuse this triggers mitosis and this will form haploid spores let's highlight dye carrion there An example of fungi being able to spread to this maximum and sometimes uh, startling fashion, kind of like in, in um, not Stranger Things, but is that The Last of Us, like um, Ellie and, you know, they're being hunted by the cordyceps and it's taking over everywhere. Well, fungi do not, aren't known to take over humans, mind you, but they do spread like bamboo, they do spread like a wildfire. The world's largest fungi, or world's largest fungus, I should say, is known as the Armillaria solipedes. And this is in the um, Malheur National Forest in Oregon. And this organism They've tested different sections of the forest. It has the same DNA as the um, known um, portions that it is this fungus species. And the, um, the organism itself covers 3.7 miles squared. So that is all one organism there. 3.7 miles squared of this area in the forest is all this armorilla area. Salopedes fungus. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Alrighty. Let's talk about how yeast reproduce. Again, these are single-celled fungi. 
they are going to reproduce, of course, by budding. So th this process basically has an area, let's call it A, this place is going to soften. Next, you'll have the actual bud at A, and the nucleus here will actually have these microtubules. Next, the nucleus will, well, one pair of the nuclei will um, go into the bud. So there's going to be two nuclei there. Um, the nucleus will be dividing by mitosis, so we're going to have division here by mitosis. One of them will go into the, the bud at point A. Once that happens, the bud breaks off, and we have this scar here. So now we have two yeasts. This will create that scar again that we were talking about called a bud scar, which is kind of self-explanatory. Alrighty. So that's how a single-celled fungi species would um, reproduce. Molds will reproduce by something called fragmentation. <sighs> the importance of fungi, they're going to be a model for eukaryotic organisms since they at the yeast level they are going to be the most simplest but they're still going to still be um eukaryotic so we could model so many things and so many processes with yeast um we could also get antimicrobials such as penicillin and they could also make food so like cheese is also from a penicillin. So these are actually connected in a surprising way. Um, genetically engineered yeast. These are able to do so many things. We could harvest insulin, um, hepatitis B vaccines. The brewer's yeast or sacco, um, my cervicae. Um, you, of course, can make wine, beer, or bread. Um, spoilage also does occur from fungi, so something to watch out for, for sure. Some medically important fungi would be the species that cause allergic shock, which could be fatal. Um, the spores are going to be triggering asthma. Um, when they grow on the human body, you have things like athlete's foot. And also mycosis, often named after um, causative agent. So something like the species Candida albicans. This will cause candidiasis, candiasis, candidiasis. And fungi make toxins. That was actually a key term, so I'm going to highlight it. Um, we have some neurotoxins. Um, some very dangerous stuff. Uh, actually, not a neurotoxin, an aflatoxin. Sorry about that. From Aspergillus. And this is going to be found in peanuts. The professor said um, don't eat anything known as a groundnut because these might have Aspergillus in them and you'll be getting hit by a carcinogen. Those toxins that some of the um, fungi make are actually carcinogens. Uh, rye mold or ergot will actually be hallucinogenic. And this is connected to the Salem witch trials. Some people may have eaten the contaminated grain 
And, of course, unfortunately, um, a lot of people, a lot of women were um, unfortunately put to death during that period in history because of the hysteria. You could also get the ergot to get a purified drug. Ergot, I mean, is pretty interesting, too. All right, let's go into the world of algae. So we're going to switching to green to talk about algae. We are currently in the protist world, but the first one on our list will be the algae. All right, let's switch over there. So, of course, algae are photoautotrophs. going to be, of course, doing photosynthesis. There's not a vascular system. So unlike plants, they, unlike the general plant, they do not have a vascular system. They do have a cellulose cell wall. Um, red algae will actually have agar. Like from, you know, the agar plates, they're going to have the same substance in their cell wall, too. Um, brown algae. will actually have something called um, alginic acid in their cell wall. There's a ton of diversity in this group. They could be aquatic. And... A lot of organisms will be defend will be depending on the algae for food. They are at the bottom of the food chain. They could be micro or macro. Like kelp is a giant algae, microscopic algae are going to be like red algae uh, that you could see in a pond. Um, some of them are actually multicellular, some of them are unicellular. All of them have chlorophyll A. They have that type. It's the different wavelengths of light, so they specifically have chlorophyll A. Microscopic algae include so let's talk about the smaller algae microscopic not there we go microscopic all right so these are single cells they have flagella some types include green brown red they have a hold fast oh shoot i'm looking at um macroscopic sorry about that um let's erase some of this so that was wrong so microscopic algae are unicellular that's correct they do have flagella um they could be free floating and they could of course grow in filaments too so unicellular um species such as the diatoms Going to be discussed here. Um, we have the diatoms with their silicate shells, and this is going to be known as the diatomaceous earth. Interesting thing about the diatomaceous diatomaceous earth, you could use it for a ton of things. Uh, Nobel, the scientist that the Nobel Prize is named after, he actually used diametaceous earth when he was trying to make TNT. So he would have nitroglycerine and then mix the diatomaceous earth together and he was able to make explosions. Um, that's just a little bit of trivia there. The silicate shells, of course, are the diametaceous earth. Um, they could have colonies, especially in the genius Volvox. They could have colonies from 500 to 60,000 individuals that are by, by um, flagellated. So they have two flagella. Um, diatoms, again, we we're talking about that they have silicon dioxide, a silicate, um, into their cell walls. 
the deposits are mined for that earth and they are going to be a filter medium as well as they're going to provide matte finishes for paint all right now let's talk about our macroscopic algae friends gonna have to highlight imitaceous earth um diatoms that's also important Okay, micro, macroscopic, not micro, macroscopic algae. These are going to be multicellular, um, green, brown, red. Um, they have hold fast. That's like an anchor. And they also have something called the stipe or a stalk. And these are going to have blades for photosynthesis. So think like kelp. That's a type of macroscopic algae. The medical importance of algae would be the indirect toxins. We have algal, algal blooms. And in this situation, here are the algal bloom, the dinoflagellate. We'll create something called a red tide. And then these are going to be from fertilizer runoff, untreated sewage, as well as warmer temperatures. Um, the gonhialex species will produce the neurotoxins, uh, saxitoxin and gonioptoxin, and some of these are the most potent non-protein poisons known. The two that they make, so saxi and gonia. Ganya toxin. Uh, selfish and fish will eat these species. And then you have, of course, bio accumulation. Over time, um, the humans eat the bioaccumulated fish that have the neurotoxins in them. And now we have paralysis and high sensitivity. Cooking does not denature the, pro the poisons. Very scary, very scary stuff. Okay, now let's talk about the protozoa, not the algae, which are still in protozo the protus group, but now the protozoa themselves. We have four phyla that we're going to be looking at. Um, a ton of them cause human diseases. First group of protists will be the apic complexins. These have an apical complex at one end. Um, this helps them penetrate the hosts. And one species would be malaria. Um, the malarian pathogen is a plasmodium. Uh, talk about the diploma, diplomonads and the parabasilids. Let's talk about the um, two in this group here. Para... Basilids. All right. They're grouped together because they are flagellated and no mitochondria. It's very unique. No uh, mitochondria. They are also asexual reproducers. These diplomats have two nuclei. They like low O2, so decrease in O2. 
um, we have the Giardia species or genus, um, Giardia lumbia, um, that causes diarrhea. And then parabacillids, these are inside hosts. And sometimes they could actually ben be beneficial for like termites. This allows them to eat cellulose and break it down. Um, some of them also can uh, give diseases like Trichomonas vaginalis. Kinetoplastids are another group. Kinetoplastids will be um, a single large mitochondria. And one of the species is the Trypanosoma um, brui, which is African sleeping sickness. And then we also have Chagas disease caused by um, T. Uh, Cruzi. Those are two pathogen examples there. They have a flagellum as well, kinetoplastids. All right, loboceans and heteroloboceans. All right, lobo and heteroloboceans. Just gonna write it like that. Okay, so these are amoeboid. And they're very flexible. Um, loboceans will extend and retract the pseudopods. However, um, we are going to also have the heterolobosins, and these are going to also have flagellated cells or flagellated forms. Um, we have a species of loboceans or genus um, Entomoba um, histilaca that is going to be diarrhea um, pathogen. And then on the other side here with the um, heterolobosians, we're going to have the Nagularia fowleri. And this is going to be the, um, the brain-eating amoeba. So kind of like a zombie. So you could draw like a crazy zombie here. So that's what they kind of do at the same time. They want brains, these amoebas. There's a person in um, Arkansas that got one of these recently as of making this video, according to the uh, professor in class. Don't drink out of hoses or stagnant water. That's how you get the brain-eating amoeba, which is a heterolobosines. All right, so now we could talk about the structure of all these protozoa. No chloroplasts, cellulose, um, or chitin. Foraminifera. However, these will have calcium shells. This specific type of um, protozoa will have those calcium shells. This will create limestone. And usually we could group the um, protus by cilia, flagellate, or pseudopod. So again, that's how they move. Um, they could move through cilia, flagella, or using pseudopods. The habitats. Well, these are going to be free-living and aquatic. They're decomposers. Some are parasites. Zooplankton is where you find a ton of these. And since they're zooplankton, they're actually going to be one level up from our algae. 
and then of course sun goes the energy goes from the sun to the algae and then the algae are eaten by zooplankton and then it just goes from there um, they're also in the soil as well as in plants or animals and they are predatory they eat the algae or other bacteria and archaea if they're, i guess they eat prokaryotes all the time all righty the white cliffs of dover are actually going to be um from the um protozoa get this right cliffs of dover and then they're white so albion um meant a word referring to the limestone there the limestone isle that's what they called england back in the day albion very fancy um let's talk about the reproduction of protozoa it's extremely complex and you could also have multi-host systems uh polymorphics are found in a lot of the protozoa this basically means that it could be a trophozyte which is the feeding form and then you could also have a cyst which is the resting form they're kind of like endospores. When the environment gets better, the cyst becomes a trophozoite, so it could utilize all those nutrients that might be in the area. Medically important protozoa. Oh, shoot, there's a ton of these. So, of course, you have the plasmodium that causes malaria, and there's about half a million deaths. And there's going to be like 660 deaths a year. That's really sad stuff. We also have amoeboiasis. This is a condition um, that involves dysentery. And this affects about 50 million a year. Uh, Cryptosporidium. Giardia. All these other ones we've talked about are going to be causing diarrhea. From water, please don't drink untreated water or raw water from Doug the Slug Evans. All the scammers are just promoting really bad um, gateways for bacteria and protozoa and all these other disease-causing things to affect you in your life. Please do not drink untreated water. Um, we also, of course, have the sleeping sickness from typranosomes. Um, there's uninhabitable areas in Africa, unfortunately, because of this sleeping sickness and the protists that causes it. All right, let's talk about slime molds very briefly. All right, mold, you might be thinking, oh, mold, that's a fungi. No, these are something else. These are going to be cellular slime molds. And their vegetative form is going to be a single amoeba. This is cool. They could... They're, they could transform. These are like transformers, kind of. Um, food will decrease, and this will create a slug. And sometimes you could also have a fruiting body. But at the same time, some of them also just make spores. Very interesting. Okay, oomocytes. My, uh, yeah, oomycetes, sorry about all these pronunciations, I'm just butchering all of them. Um, these are going to be water molds. They're going to have uh, white threads on decaying material. They're, of course, going to use the digestive 
secretions. Uh, they have cellulose in the cell wall. Not chitin, that's why they're not a fungi. Um, they're going to be causing blight, mildew, all those bad things for crops. Right now, we're going to talk about the squirmy wormies, the helminths. This is like tapeworms, flukes, all those things. Roundworms, oh my goodness, I do not. Personally, um, these are my least favorite. Okay, so again, we talked about round worms, tapeworms, and then also flat worms or flukes. They are invaders. Of the host tissues. About a hundred million people are actually infected, which is scary. Um, there's water contact involved. And then, of course, the digestive tract. And then also the skin. Those are the means of contacting the helmets, but you do not want to do that. Those are their routes of entry, so please be very careful. All right, so first let's talk about the nematode. Um, Cherita bancrofti. All right, this one is going to be, um, the entry is through mosquito. And they're going to block the lymphatic vessels. And then you get a ton of swelling in a condition called elephantiasis. That's a ton of swelling. It's very painful. Um, we also have another nematode here, so I'm going to just do that. We have onchocerca Volvuvus. Volvus. Um, this is going to be flies. That's the mode of spread. Um, 18 million people are affected. Um, this is going to be inflammation because of a bacteria known as wool bacchia pipetins. Pipientus, actually. And that's going to just inflame the eyes, which is, again, horrible. Life cycles. We're going to have intermediate hosts. These are going to be like the snail for a fluke called uh, Schizoma myceni. Um, this is where they're just going to grow. And then we have, of course, the, um, let me get back to my place here, the definitive hosts. And these are going to be key terms. Definitive hosts. This is where reproduction happens. Of course, that's going to be a human. Um, there's also a dead end host. Which also could be a human, but in this case, um, the infection by the parasite will uh, normally complete its lifestyle in another host. So, uh, swimmer's itch is caused by flukes, and that's when they're getting trapped in there, and they're just like going around. Um, there's no repro here. And a dead end host. All right, roundworms again. These are going to go into the digestive system. Um, type of them would be the Ascaris genus. This is going to cause ascariasis. This is a very common roundworm disease. They're free living, they're parasitic, um, their digestive tract goes from mouth to anus. That's a complete gut. 
All right, roundworms are covered. Let's go to the nematodes. Again, just another word for roundworms, but there's one in the brain from um, feces contamination. So the person was eating wild grasses in Australia. Um, the nematode that had eggs was usually a parasite for carpet pythons, but she had some of those eggs, I guess, on the grass. And now she had this worm in her brain, which was unfortunate and also horrifying at the same time. It happened August 28th of 2023, so actually this year as a recording, a few months ago. Okay, tapeworms. These are horror shows as well. There's a person, as of recording, they're on TikTok. They ate a fish that had a ton of tapeworms, and um, it was not pretty. They are extremely parasitic. They're flat. Um, they could go up to one meter. They actually look like ribbons. They're going to absorb nutrients from the body through their body, the prog glottids. This is a little segments. That's what they're going to use to absorb. The scolex has suckers and hooks for attachment. And it's basically just a little nutrient thief that it's going to just be there and it's going to drain you of your vitality. And they're just going to start reproducing. The farthest proglottid is where the eggs are. That breaks off. The feces go out with the eggs. And then that's how they spread. They're in undercooked meat. So they have this like really, really like messed up body. And then the head, it's a horror show. They have like these weird barbs and then they have like these socket looking things. It is so messed up. Dude, like tapeworms actually freak me out. So do worms in general. Please make sure your meat is cooked well and you're, you know, practicing hygiene. You do not want these. All right, flukes. These are flatworms. I just wrote fat worms. I meant flatworms. Sorry about that. Um, they have a mouth and no anus. The suckers, again, hold them in place. And then they love fluids. They love drinking them fluids. Um, there's going to be a two hosts. Again, we talked about the snail and the human, right? There's the intermediate snail and then the definitive human. And yes, schizomyosis is a species of the fluke. All right, that's going to cover all the eukaryotes. Thank you so much for tuning in. A lot of freaky stuff happened in these slides. A lot of interesting and horrifying if i'm being honest facts were learned in this class period when <laughs> the professor is teaching i was so like freaked out Alrighty, so yeah thanks so much for tuning in good evening we love you and please do something nice for someone take care everyone